This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Levijou. Welcome to episode 24 of the podcast. We were on a bit of a summer hiatus for various and sundry reasons, but we're back. Uh, Mark got to spend about a month of uh, his summer vacation back home in Australia. Uh, myself, unfortunately, spent most of the summer working, uh, you know, camps and the usual sorts of things. Uh, but in between, we were also working on the development of our first Volleyball Coaching Wizards book, which we expect to have out pretty soon. We're just going through the editing of the transcriptions of the interviews we're using, and uh, we'll get it out the door and into people's hands. The reviews so far have been great. Uh, so we're we're really excited to get it out there and to start a whole season, uh, excuse me, a whole series of what we think will be really useful, really interesting books to contribute to the volleyball coaching literature and and to literature above and beyond that. Getting back to this particular episode, um, the Olympics have just ended, so we get together and have a discussion about what we liked and didn't like, and you know all the ins and outs and just share our thoughts on, on the, the event and the experience. Um, so we're back in a regular programming now, so expect uh, further episodes to come. In the meantime, here we are talking about the Olympics. So the overall impressions of the, of the men's tournament, because that's the, what I watch the most of, uh, yeah, it was a little bit surprising. It didn't go exactly the way that I expected. Um, and that's partly a little bit of uh, forgetfulness and short-sightedness on my part, uh, paying a little bit too much attention to what happened in World League. Um, so obviously in World League, Italy and the USA were, were teams that were very disappointing, but um, the, the lesson there is that teams are preparing in different ways. and and practicing particularly during that period that's not always conducive to being really good during World League but obviously in this case and 2012 was the the previous example um, conducive to great performances at the Olympics so that was the number one impression uh, I would have I would have been surprised or I am surprised that you don't actually list Poland in there among the, the World League um, disappointments because they didn't even advance to the final stage. Um, and they just seemed to play horribly. But the idea there was that we're, you know, we're resting people, we're trying to get ready for the Olympics, and still they were kind of up and down in the Olympics themselves. The difference, the difference is, uh, the fairly big difference, is that USA and Italy played all World League with essentially their starters. They played they played to win World League, whereas um, with the exception of Serbia, obviously, the other teams clearly didn't play to win World League. So for that reason, Poland was more an unknown quantity, I guess, but uh, it was clear from the very beginning how they managed their roster through the different weekends that it wasn't a priority for them. So... Uh, that could well be a, an explanation for their up and down performance, and also the up and down performance of France at the Olympics. I I was writing about that today, whether the fact that both of those teams had to qualify so late it affected the way they they managed the recovery and the and the training of their of their main guys, and uh, they had to play that important tournament right after the end of the season uh, you could see in the tournament how in Japan that is how how flat even the, the, the guys were but they they got through it and won and they, they then had their rest but uh, I wonder if that was the contributing factor or the main contributing factor to the not so great performances for France and Poland Right, and, and you kind of you make the point about the USA basically playing its starting team through World League. You know, it was primarily the team that played they played in the Olympics. Yeah, you know, they mixed things around, and Russell came up 
um, as a big contributor during the Olympics, whereas he had injury issues and form issues during during World League. Um, yeah. But the U.S. was able to mix players around all through that process. Um, yeah. France, and you kind of talked about this in your in your piece. They've got a starting team, and then not much depth below that. So there's not yeah. a lot of mixing around going on for Thiele with that group of guys. So I imagine that that must have worn on them over the course of the summer. I'm sure that it. I'm sure that it did. They played three years now, more or less maxima, more or less flat out all the time with with those six guys and uh, watching them play at the Olympics, they uh, they didn't have the same uh, the same feeling, the same joy in playing, for want of a better description. That that's really the hallmark of the way that they the way that they play, and they never they never seemed to reach a point where they could play with real freedom for any extended period of time, and that's how they play the best and I guess a couple of times against Italy against USA they they were they were dominating they were able to have that little period of play but they could never hang on to it and uh, was really disappointing I think for a lot of people for volleyball fans for neutral people that they didn't go further in the tournament well and, you know, you can you look at them in their first match and wonder what, what was happening there. Early start, did they not sleep the night before? Yeah, they played Italy first, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes? Yeah, the first and game was the 9.30 yeah. a.m. game against Italy, uh, the very first game of the tournament. It's uh, To play at 9.30 is, a really, is really disruptive. In it, You have to do everything differently because... You have to get up at five thirty. You have to have a, a really big breakfast at you know at six o'clock, and uh, then you've got an hour's travel uh, to the game. And uh, it's not it's completely out of what you would normally do, even if you uh, simulate it before the tournament. And having said that, of course, Italy with exactly the same conditions absolutely right. crushed. But uh, uh, but yeah, they almost certainly didn't sleep didn't sleep properly and if you watch that first eight points when they were eight two down or six two down whatever it was then they really did look a little bit like they were sleepwalking through and Mm -hmm. uh, that that put them on the back foot for the whole tournament and and they never really recovered yeah now my personal feeling on the men's side is right now there's probably half a dozen teams that on any given day could beat each other yeah. Brazil, U.S., Poland, Russia, uh, Italy, France, probably kind of is in, on their day. France can beat anybody. You, know, you might be able to throw another. I mean, Argentina obviously had a very good tournament. I would put uh, them yeah. in that group necessarily, but you know, on their day they can certainly be a threat. Um, Iran, I don't, I don't think, think is in that group either, but they're close. You could add the uh, two or three European teams who didn't qualify to that group: Bulgaria, Serbia, Germany, who aren't aren't that far aren't that far away from that group. Yeah, and I and I contrast it to the women's side where Serbia was clearly a surprise, and they obviously had a great tournament. But going in, the expectations were the three teams that were the the, the favorites were going to be USA, Brazil, China. Uh, yeah. Brazil obviously disappointed, didn't make it past the quarterfinals. Uh, Serbia so had a great the tournament. Um, the Netherlands, under you know our good friend Giovanni, uh, had a great tournament. Which program. yeah, friend of the program. Uh, I a lot of people were shocked by that, but I wasn't really one of them because he's had that team developing really nicely since he took over. Uh, so I kind of figured they'd have a good term now. You know, did I think they would? be a medal contender maybe not maybe not but i thought they were definitely going to be a factor and you know he's clearly got them in a good place well where they did they win world grand prix or netherlands no 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 they uh, but they made the finals they had a great result at grand prix yep. and uh, i mean he's done really well with uh, with every group that he's ever had so 
uh, still Netherlands are coming from a long way back in the field to to end up being a contender as they were. So yeah, it's obviously they, a great I job. Was, I think their world ranking was something like seventeen, which of course yeah. goes back to you know goes back a couple of years in terms of how that's all rated. Which which actually brings up the seeding question because in both cases on the men's side and the women's side you had a majority of teams advancing to the medal round coming out of one pool. In the women's case, all four teams came from the same pool. And in the men's case, yeah. it, was, uh, it was three out of four. And the three medalists, yeah. Right. But that's that's happened that's happened several times before. It, and in the men's side, it happened in 96. It happened in 2000. Both times, the all four quarter final, or semi-finalists came from the same pool. So uh, the pools... The pools at the Olympics are not exactly even. Uh, the world rankings that they use as a basis are they have some tiny little flaws in there that uh, and inconsistencies. For example, uh, France didn't get the points for winning World League last year. They only got the points for winning um, for winning Division Two Pool B of World League, which would have put them one or two places higher in the world rankings and actually would have put them in the other pool instead of uh, pool A. Which would have probably and, uh, seen them advance. Uh, it would have changed the complexion of the tournament, let's put yeah, it that way. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, but also the United States, because the Norseekers Seeker, didn't run a, a zonal tournament last year, they only ran an Olympic qualifier. USA, who would normally have won nor seekers didn't play in the event because they'd already qualified at world cup so they actually would have also gone up a, a place in the um in the uh world rankings and if i remember rightly us and france would have ended up in pool b and russia would have ended up in pool a instead of uh, one of those so huh. uh they use those rankings as the basis for everything but they uh they're fairly inconsistent in how they give the points and, and apply the, the different um, rules, I guess. Right. Now, we, we did have a bit of controversy with the, the final day's play, specifically the Italy-Canada match. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think Kevin Barnett called it a great acting job by Italy. Yeah. I, I didn't see the I didn't see the match. I I plan to see it at some point, but my my view on that is that uh, if a team earns the right to be able to control parts of their own destiny, then they have the right to exercise that. Yeah. And uh, it's not. I personally, I don't really like it. Uh, as a fan, obviously, I don't like it. Uh, as an opponent, I I don't like it, except that I can't guarantee that I wouldn't do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've per never personally been in that situation, but I know people personally who have and have chosen that path. And uh, <laughs> the, the only kind of amusing side note to that is that it ended up being Brazil, France, uh, playing winner take all for a spot in the quarterfinals, and Bernardino is a guy who has exercised that right several times in the past. And I wondered if uh, Karma would uh, would come back to him, but <laughs> it turned out turns out that in volleyball there's no Karma, well, or at least about that. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess the question will be, yeah, I don't think anybody denies Italy the right to do with their lineup whatever they feel is appropriate at the time. Rest guys, you guys, use guys part time, get some other guys playing time, whatever. Um, the the issue is whether they intentionally threw the match in order to force a situation where either only Brazil or France was going to get through, and then you know, thus making the path to the medal easier. Obviously, it didn't work out for them this way because they 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 lost to the team in the final. That was the team they put in that position. So, you know, as you say, karma. Um, but you, you know, were they thinking that way, or were they thinking just in terms of 
those wrestling guys. I don't think that in in the end it makes a difference one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I also think the same thing that that the teams had earned that privilege, earned that position, and they can do with it as they see fit. To it doesn't always work. Uh, losing, as Platonov uh, said in some interview that I read. Uh, losing always has its own problems, right. uh, always creates problems, and uh, only the best coaches, only the best teams can can manage those problems. I think, and uh, in the end, you know, I, it shouldn't be what we what we end up talking about. And um, and Brazil ended up beating them, so you know, maybe maybe that was karma. Although Brazil always end up winning more or less. <laughs> Um, all right, I can guess your answer to this, but favorite match? Uh, favorite match? I really enjoyed the Russia-Poland match. Um, I very much enjoyed the semifinal, the um, uh, USA-Italy. USA I, I thought that was a great great up and down match a great spectacle uh and what else did i what else did i enjoy there was one other five set match i think that doesn't uh doesn't ring a bell right now maybe maybe usa brazil um the usa matches when they got on a roll were were, were pretty entertaining matches uh i enjoyed watching watching all of those they were probably my favorite team to watch in the tournament I will exclude myself from making comments. I mean, the USA Brazil match was fantastic, and it was it was great to see the level of play. Although yeah. you could perhaps say that Wallace wasn't at his best yet. It seemed like after that match, he really turned it on and became yeah. the dominant force for the rest of the tournament, pretty much. Uh, I think for me, for me, he was the the tournament MVP, and I was. I was surprised that uh, that they gave it to Sergio, but yeah. surprised yeah. in some sense, maybe not in another sense. But <laughs> uh, but but Wallace was Wallace was great, and and uh, they they had problems with their outsides. They they had problems with their reception, and and he really he really carried them. And I think Bernardino in the press conference said that. Uh, Wallace earned a place in the in the Hall of Greats, Brazilian volleyball greats, and uh, I think that's probably a fair uh, fair observation. Yeah, agreed. Uh, how much, if any, of the women's side did you watch? <laughs> I saw the fifth set of the Serbia USA game replay. I think that's all. I, that's all I saw. Oh, you mean the you mean the semifinal? Yeah, that would have been the semifinal. The, the semifinal that uh, that that last said just to just to see what happened for myself. <laughs> um, Serbia was probably the most entertaining team, I think, to watch on that side. Uh, just they go for it, which is always fun to watch. Uh, I mean, I I, saw, I literally saw one set, and but they seem to be an aggressive team, mm -hmm. a team that uh, that played hard. That were uh, uh, the team that worked well together. I can't really add much more than more than that because it was also you know a semi final, so there's a lot of emotion there. But yeah. um, but they definitely played well and they played tough in that. Uh, in that moment when they they could have really given it away at eight eleven and nobody would have uh, eight eleven against the world champions and gold medal favourites if they'd lost from there nobody nobody would have said anything other than uh, good tournament good luck in the bronze. Now you've you've made the observation I believe that the European qualifying tournament is the toughest global volleyball tournament. In terms of quality of teams, top to bottom, am I correct on that? 
I may have said that in the past, yes. <laughs> now, obviously, in the Olympics, you've got a team like Mexico, Egypt, on the women's side, Puerto Rico, uh, I'm forgetting who else was, was the minnows. So there is, yeah. there is that element of things. But once you advance beyond the group stages, what do you yep. think? Is the Olympics this year, especially on the men's side, was pretty competitive, pretty intense. I, it was all of those things. And uh, I don't think that, uh, that particularly Serbia, particularly Germany, would have been watching that thinking that they weren't a chance for a medal. They were, um, you know, Serbia were, weren't close to qualifying. They, they finished sixth, I think, in the, in the qualification. So um, they, they weren't in any possibility to qualify, but, uh, but they played well in World League this year and, and uh, would have had a shot for sure. If if they'd used, played with that form and and Germany had a match point against uh, against Poland that effectively would have put them into the Olympics or at least through the through the second round tournament. So you know they they could have done at least as well as uh, as Poland by definition. So it's uh, there were there were teams from Europe who would have had a shot at a medal uh, who weren't at the Olympics and. I'm not sure that that's a good thing for for world volleyball. And I understand that all the zones need to be represented, and all parts of the world need to be represented in the, in the Olympics. That's part of the point of the Olympics. But I think that there could have been a slightly different qualification process. Okay. Um, in terms of any of the stuff that kind of went around the matches, uh, and we've, we've kind of joked about the quality of broadcasts, at, not just at the Olympics, but at World League and at World Championships and all these other tournaments in terms of commentators and production values and things like that. Uh, what was your overall feel in terms of the quality of the production? Uh, the... Production, I think, was great. was was fine. It they they had the spider camera above right. that they seemed to use at some odd moments. Um, uh, but you know, I I really think about the women's semi final where between rallies they were uh, focusing on on really on the individuals playing. So. There was uh, lots of close-ups of Castelo on one side and the Serbian girl, whose name I don't recall, on the other side. So they they were turning it into a little bit of an individual battle through the um, uh, through the TV pictures, and and I think that's what makes one of the things that makes volleyball such a great TV sport is is the ability to focus on the on the individuals between between rallies. The general, uh, I watched only nearly everything on Polish TV, so uh, I didn't hear any of the the international broadcast center commentators. Uh, so I don't have to make a comment on that. Uh, that could get me in, that could get me into trouble. Um, but the the pictures were great. The I don't know what cameras they were using for the. Uh, block touch on the challenge system, but the ones they were showing on TV showed everything, showed everything perfectly, and and you could see what was touched, what wasn't touched, and uh, you know that's a that's a great addition too. So um, I don't have I don't have any uh, any conversations at all about the um, about the the coverage of the of the pictures at least. I, I agree. I think the production quality was, aside from the fact that, at least in the States, you had seemingly random commercial breaks that NBC would throw in there. Uh, so you end up missing two, three points, which sometimes was a, a momentum swing. Uh, and that was especially on the main broadcast, on the main NBC. Uh, on the yeah. satellite channels, NBC's SN or USA or whatever, they were less frequent and less intrusive, but it was mm -hmm. it was rather annoying. You'd be just like, Whoa, 
why don't we just step away? Uh, and that's one of the areas where I thought maybe you missed the technical timeout because now the networks are trying to squeeze in commercial breaks whenever they feel it's appropriate instead of having a designated time to be able to do that. Um, and you commented very early on that you didn't miss the technical timeouts at all. And from a just a, from a pure spectator point of view, I, I totally agree. It was just that from the network side of things, it, it was a little bit problematic. Yeah, I I understand that part of it, and uh, that that could well be. But also, but I watched the only streams, so uh, I didn't I didn't watch any actual TV coverage. I, I should have been clear about that. I watched the Polish. TV stream mm -hmm. rather than any other country stream. So right. um, I think that's a that's a fair comment. Um, I wasn't used to it though. It was uh, funny yesterday during the final. I I uh, at 16 in one of the sets I jumped up to go to the toilet and and was very shocked to come back and find that the score was had a, uh, advanced to 17 in my absence and thinking, <laughs> mm, what happened? I wasn't gone for a minute. A uh, minute and a half, there. and uh, completely forgotten about the technical timeout, not being there. Yeah. Um, as for the commentary, uh, mostly decent. Uh, it was a mixed bag in, in terms of who who did well and who didn't. There, there was one of your countrymen did not do well, but I, did, I, I think only heard him cover one match during the pool phase. Um, yeah. The, the Canadian, uh, a lot of a lot of the the non-U.S. stuff I ended up watching on the Canadian stream. Um, they yeah, did okay, yeah. they're okay. There there was one kind of crew where there was a there was a woman doing the the commentary. Smart former mm -hmm. player clearly, but struggled with with uh, kind of get her getting her thoughts expressed. Um, but yeah, you know, not not horrible. Not like oh my god, she's killing this. Uh, I think. <laughs> Other than that, most for all almost all the U.S. matches, I was listening to Sunderland Barnett, which yeah. is generally good. You know, they know the game; they can talk about some of the details that just your random commentators can't necessarily talk about because they've been there and they've done mm -hmm. a lot of matches, both individually and together. I mean, Sunderland yeah. has his little pet peeves that he goes off on periodically, which can kind of get annoying. Yeah. Uh, the one thing, and this kind of leads into something I did want to talk about. The one thing that did kind of annoy me on, uh, for both of them, is late in the tournament, in the in the knockout stages, they were grumbling about the double sub. Uh, okay. In particular, they were really going on about it during the Brazil Argentina quarterfinal. And yep. and this is after they had been, you know, applauding both Velasco and Bernardino as being legendary coaches and. All the famers and the great of the great, and then they go yeah. on and say, "I really don't agree with this double sub thing." And oh, you know, Velasco needs to unwind that double sub. That was a horrible double sub, and da da da. I'm like, come on, you just went and said these are some of the greatest coaches that have ever coached the game. You don't trust them to make decisions based on an assessment that they've made of how their team performs. You know, I, you know, I don't know the process that those two coaches have gone through, but I'd like to think that both of them, on some level, have looked at it and said, you know what, we're at least a little bit better making this change for these three rotations than if we left the other guys in. I'm, I'm fairly confident that they've thought about it more than just a little bit, and mm. I don't... Uh, personally use it. I don't like it very much. I find that it, um, for my liking, it disrupts the, the flow of the game a little bit. Uh, but I've, I've spoken to a member of Bernardino's staff about exactly this topic because uh, Bernardino has used it throughout his career. So in all of the eight finals that he's played in a row, he's used the double sub extensively with with all the teams that he's had over those years. And um, the the member of his staff said that they studied this and they specifically uh, like 
that it disrupts the opposing team. So that those three rotations, the the other team has to look at different things, they have to watch a different set, or they have to change their focus, and also by implication, when the other setter comes back, they have to do the same thing again. So from that, I, as I understand that lot, uh, line of reasoning, they're talking about not necessarily just those three points, but uh, a longer term effect of, uh, of changing the game up in such a significant way. Um, I... And Karch uses it regularly with USA Women. Uh, I yes, yes, they they did it a lot. I know in the last quad with uh, with Hugh as a coach, they they were really systematic in doing it every time. I don't think they were so much this time. I didn't no, no, have they, didn't, they didn't do it every single time. They did it in Grand Prix. And they've done it yeah. in other tournaments, but you're right. He wasn't as systematic about it this time. With, in London, they, they did it every set. Um, but that might be a personnel factor as well because the, the first setter was uh, Lindsay Berg and the second setter was, uh, was Courtney Thompson. So right. they, they thought that they, they gained a lot by, in those three rotations, obviously. In the in the men's game, and I can't really speak about the women's game so much. But in the men's game, the thing, the biggest reason why I don't really like it very much is uh, is you end up with the setter in one one extra time, and um, and in men's teams that's nearly always a problem in siding out. And uh, so for me, you get a an extra an extra problem in your worst siding out rotation or potentially right. your worst siding out rotation. But right. like I said, Bernardino is way, way smarter than me and he reckons his teams are better and he has uh, a fair few runs on the board to back up any decision that he makes about anything. All right, now... Including, including throwing games in tournaments. <laughs> now, on the subject of substitutions... One of the things that we saw in the Italy USA semifinal was yes. when Italy was down big in the third set. Mm-hmm. Yes. Basically, all the you know Zaitsev came off, Wantarena came off, probably at least one other of the starters came off, and were rested, you know, and, and taken off for most of you know at least like half the set, I think, um, while the the substitutes got absolutely pounded. At the same yep. time, none of the U.S. starters came out. Yep. Which is, well, there's for, first, there's two parts to this. First, this is something you don't see happen a lot with U.S. teams. I, yep. I can't remember a time a U.S. team did this, either a national team or at the college level or anywhere else. But it is something you see professional teams do. It is something you see international, you know, national teams do. Um. What's the what's the motivation there? What's the motivation between taking all the starters off or leaving all the starters on? Off. For taking them off. Yeah. Uh, I I have done this many times in the past in a similar situation, and the the reason is, at least theoretically, is to break the momentum of the other team. So. If a, if a team is on that bigger roll that they're leading 14-4, which is what I think they were leading in yeah, that match, then I have no chance to win the set. And the only thing I can do is to disrupt and annoy the other team as much as I possibly can. So um, I'll, I'll use all my timeouts, all my substitutions. If I'm... If I'm really, if I really want to annoy them and dis- disrupt them in the biggest possible way, uh, I might even save a substitution for 24, just you know, just for uh, for maximum effect. Although, and I made comment to that with uh, with Luke, who I was watching the game with, but they had, but uh, Italy had used all their t- their timeouts before 12 or 11, so they couldn't do that. Uh, 
if I can, if I have the opportunity, then I would also use all the uh, uh, all the challenges that I had for the same reason, just to just to make it as long and drawn out and take the emotion out of the game, take the momentum out of it. So I really have the opportunity to start the next set uh, from scratch with a clean slate. Okay, now flip it around. You're the team that's winning 14-4. to four. Why do you not take your starters off? Uh, because I have momentum and I don't want to lose it. I have guys who are playing great, who are feeling confident, who are feeling good. Um, in that situation, I never want to screw around with that. Even though you know what the other guy's doing. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Now, yeah, obviously we can't say one way or the other what impact leaving Zaitsev and Wancharena would have had on on the match if they had stayed in the whole time in, in set three. But is there any potential that sending them out in set three recharge them, refresh them, whatever, refocus them for set four. Uh, I, I think history uh, says yes to that question. Well, if we're saying that Zaitsev ripped off the last five points of the match, then yes, but of the, the fourth set, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, they, they came out, the f I don't remember exactly the play, but uh, but Zaitsev hit one of the first couple of balls he, he he ripped some some ball and and scored, and you knew straight away that this was a, a different set. And mm -hmm. you know, the, it gave a great TV moment as well because you could uh, you could see Wantarena and Zaitsev, who are who until recently were immortal enemies or eternal enemies, talking to each other on the bench and geeing each other on. So uh, there was there was a great TV moment as well. So yeah. Then Jenny had all of everything. Right. All right. Um, any other thoughts, observations, conclusions, ideas, uh, whatever? One one thing that uh, we we talk about, we have talked about a few times, is the, and we mentioned it earlier, the lack of depth of the French team and. While I think that that's true and valid, I think if you look at the tournament up and up and down, so the top ten teams, uh, they're actually in reality the same held for all the teams. So no, there were no teams, with the possible exception of US, in the bronze medal match with Pretty. There were no teams in the tournament would have been able to or were able to. Uh, to cover for the absence of one of their starters. So when uh, with uh, with Poland, if Kubiak went out, that was it against uh, uh, against Russia again, and in, again in the quarterfinals, if he was off, they they couldn't replace him. And to a degree, the same with Mika. Um, the with the Brazilians, it was the same. With the Italians, it was the same. Antonov. Was Antonov or Vittori were not able to to contribute anywhere close to the same level. So uh, that would be a, an overall observation of the tournament that um, none of the teams I think had had very good depth, uh, and you know, maybe uh, that affected the the outcome of the tournament. Um, so the one pushback I might have. And, I, and, I, and the USA women were an example of exactly what you're saying, because as soon as Luka Akaradunov went out in the semifinal against Serbia, it, it definitely caused issues with the U.S. team. Uh, yeah. But I would I would argue that with Brazil, they, they had Luka Relli out for stretches, and it didn't really seem to, to phase them a heck of a lot. Uh. They they messed around. They messed around. They changed around uh, Maurizio and and Lippe, I yep. think early in the tournament. Yep. Uh, but when they were doing that, they were losing. So uh, when they settled, finally settled on Lippe was in that before that match against France, and uh, they then won the next four matches. And 
Maurizio came on right at the very end, I think, when they were when they were ahead, and um, and Lucarelli was actually injured. They played they played him despite his injury in the in that final when the last two games actually. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we can we can quibble we can quibble about it a little bit, but uh, if we, you know, I think if we compare with the teams of uh, uh, some of the Olympic title games from from 10 12 you know three olympics ago two three olympics ago where um where the italian teams were stars from top to bottom where the russian team um could interchange players freely where even the brazilians when the beginning of the of this brazilian run they they could play you know easily 10 guys and still be um you know 97 percent as effective uh, i think that's one of the the comments, the observations I'd make overall about this tournament. Okay. For me, it was just a lot of fun. Was some really good volleyball. In some <laughs> cases, just great volleyball. Uh, uh, there was plenty of good volleyball, and from some surprising quarters. So, the the Canada US match was was a great game with a surprise ending. The US and and Italy, as we talked about, were all of their games were were high level, or all of Italy's games, most of the US games. Um, there was a little bit of drama. There was some some grudge matches going on, and uh, and there was a great last couple of days, especially from Brazil. So, um, you know, not everybody's happy, but I think overall it was a it was a fun tournament, as you say. Yeah. Just and it shows you just how hard it is to win. Because some good teams uh, didn't, didn't come away with a gold medal. Uh, nearly all the teams didn't come away with a gold medal. <laughs> that's been, all right. That's true. Well, unless right. if you get, unless you get anything else, I think we can uh, wrap that up. Oh, uh, I think that's uh, that's the highlights for me, and uh, be really looking forward to what happens with in a few teams what uh, what coaching moves there may may not be which players kick on which players retire um, the, a really fun season to watch is always the season after an Olympic uh, cycles finished so uh, we always have lots of lots of things to look forward to lots of uh, lots of exciting prospects to consider it's a big name retirements uh, yeah but most of those guys have retired at least once already, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's let's wait before we get too excited. All right, we'll end it there. All right. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.